So uh, first of all, welcome. Uh, second, uh, before uh, I introduce our keynote, I just want to take a moment to give a truly heartfelt uh, uh, thank you to uh, the staff at APSA because this is my favorite conference and if they weren't here, it wouldn't be here. So thank you very, very much, really. Just thanks so, so much. Uh, you, know, you respond to our annoying emails, so just for that. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to take uh, now to introduce uh, Stephen Rathgeb Smith, who is the executive director of the American Political Science Association. Uh, Stephen has had a long uh, career teaching at schools like Duke, Syracuse University, the University of Washington. Uh, he has published uh, some very interesting research, uh, uh, for example, our nonprofits for hire, the welfare state in the age of contracting, and nonprofits and advocacy. He has served as the president of the Association for Research on Nonprofit Organizations and Voluntary Actions, uh, and uh, done a lot of other great work. And uh, I'm very happy uh, that he is here to uh, speak to us. And so let's give a warm welcome to Stephen Rathgeb Smith. Thank you very much. I'd, I'd like to thank the conference program committee. Um, hold on one second here. I got to uh, just so I can my my notes don't fall off here. Okay, so I'd like to um, thank thank you, Victor, for that very nice introduction. I'd also like Victor. I'd like to thank the APSA staff for the terrific work they've done in support of this conference and and my participation in particular. I really wouldn't want I wouldn't have known where to go without Kim. Kim Mealy's uh, direction and support, and, uh, and so I really appreciate not only her help for me, but her, her again, her support in, in, um, for the entire conference. Um, I'm also very honored to be giving this keynote address, um, given that a long line of distinguished political scientists have given this keynote, including Mike Brittenall last year and Roger Smith in 2010. Um, you know, the, the opportunity to give these kinds of addresses is always one for me anyway, always forces one to kind of reflect on one's career. And so um, it, what I'm gonna talk about now is kind of my reflections on, my, on the evolution of my teaching career. Um, my first teaching experience was as a teaching assistant during my doctoral work in political science at MIT. Um, I was a teaching assistant for many top-notch scholars and teachers there, but my model for an exemplary lecturer and teacher was James Q. Wilson at Harvard. Um, the Harvard government department at the time was always short of TAs in American politics, which was one of my fields, so they relied on graduate students from other universities in the Boston area. So I was a TA for Wilson for three semesters, and I, I marveled at his brilliant and succinctly delivered 50-minute lectures. Um, these lectures were parsimonious, but packed with information. I still have my notes from these lectures somewhere, although I'm not, I don't think I know exactly where they are, uh, given my moves in recent years. Um, but, um, you know, and I, indeed, I've seen countless lectures since then, you know, and Wilson, for me, is still the model of an exemplary lecture. Um, you know, but again, with, uh, like a lot of graduate students, you know, I, um, my work for Wilson, I was a teaching assistant, so I led the discussion section. Um, so I didn't really have a lot of experience teaching my own classes while I was in graduate school. And so I didn't, um, I didn't really do that until I arrived in Duke in 1988. John, John and I arrived, John arrived in 87, I arrived in 88. Um, and so I, I had a joint appointment in public policy and political science, and so John and I go, go way back. Um, uh, but my teaching at Duke was much different than the large 200, two to 300 lecture classes that Wilson taught. Um, most of my classes were smaller seminized classes where there was a lot of interaction expected from the professor um, and the, the large lecture size of the model for Wilson just didn't fit so well. And I was also doing a lot of my teaching in a public policy program that stressed the interaction between theory and practice so students 
were keenly interested in the application of theories of public policy and political science in real world cases. The Duke Public, as an aside, the Duke Public Policy Program had a large and continues to have a very large undergraduate major in public policy, but then they have a graduate program, a master's program in public policy. So I was teaching undergraduates as well as graduate students. So my, um, so my interest in applications led to my initial exposure to teaching cases in a kind of case-based learning style. Some of my colleagues at Duke, including Bob Bain, used teaching cases initially developed at the Kennedy School of Government to illustrate a wide variety of concepts from executive leadership to public-private partnerships to policy implementation. This period in the late 80s and early 90s was also in the pre-web era, so we also had to order cases directly from the Kennedy School by actually calling them and placing an order um, or sending them a letter. Um, all of the cases were copyrighted, um, and so you had to get copyright permission to, to use them if you wanted to reproduce them. Um, so using teaching cases represented quite a shift in my teaching style. The classic Wilson-style lecture is a deductive form of learning with the professor at the center. The emphasis is on the imparting information to the student as clearly and cogently as possible. The TA section is designed as a discussion opportunity where students can ask questions and review material presented in the lecture. The focus of the learning process, even in the discussion sector, though, is still on the lecture and the accompanying readings. But the use of the teaching cases is a more inductive form of learning that shifts, at least in part, the direction of the learning process to the student. Thus, in a case, teaching, a case method teaching approach, the professor does not primarily lecture, but instead moderates a classroom discussion among students in which the students compare their different approaches and learning with each other together and together reach a richer understanding of the dilemmas and principles involved in a particular decision or situation. Typically, students are presented with a scenario that requires a decision and students are asked to make a recommendation. Students are expected to marshal the necessary evidence, support their recommendation, and memos can be assigned to then ask students to make their arguments in writing. Um, I started using this teaching case method when I was at Duke, but I still relied heavily on lectures or small, well, to a certain le lectures, but small seminar site discussion seminar. It was not a case-based teaching approach. It was only when I moved to Seattle and the University of Washington in the mid-90s that my case-based case -based teaching approach became a more prominent part of my teaching repertoire. I was teaching in a professional graduate program, the Evans School of Public Affairs, which lent itself to a case-based approach, especially since many students were interested in usable knowledge to borrow from uh, a fellow Yale political science, a uh, fellow colleague of Robert Dahl, political scientist Charles Lindblom. Um, I was teaching courses on NGO management, social policy, comparative social policy, political analysis. Over time, I broadened topics to include case meditation, which includes to NGO advocacy, government NGO relations, diversity in the public and nonprofit sector, and interest group politics, to name a few. Um, during the 1990s and early 2000, the universe of case teaching was relatively restricted and narrow. A few large research institutes and universities, including Harvard and the University of Washington, had case repositories, and the format was relatively standard, a 10 to 15 page single space printed case. However, trends in higher education have then affected case teaching and its delivery. First, the internationalization of higher education and the growth of universities abroad has, has, uh, that then have their own case collections have led to much greater diversity in cases around the world and the growth of the case teaching method in many different countries. Indeed, I, t I was fortunate enough to teach a class last March in, in, at the University of Hong Kong where I used mostly cases developed at the University of Hong Kong and other Asian universities. Second, um, uh, the digital revolution has greatly reduced the transaction cost of producing cases. When I started teaching in the 1980s, one had to rely on case collections such as the Kennedy School because one could not reasonably create a case as a solo scholar since it required substantial resources. But now access to inf information is remarkably quicker, cheaper, and easier. So the, an individual faculty member can assemble their own cases even without the help of a graduate student or the Kennedy School. This, sh this shift has allowed greater diversity in the type of cases. To be sure, we still have traditional printed cases. The Kennedy School, Kennedy School still has its, its case repository. Um, but many scholars have created quasi-cases, 
uh, that rely upon newspaper articles and other material easily accessible through the web as teaching cases. My friend Kent Weaver at Georgetown and Brookings, for example, has created many different quasi cases to teach comparative policy and politics. For example, he has a quasi case on coalition formation, on comparative policy, on, on he has a quasi case on coalition formation in Germany where he uses various types of information including newspaper articles and other contemporary sources to run a simulation in the class where upon students play different roles in the German parliament. Third, the digital revolution has also allowed new technologies and approaches to be employed with cases. So I was fortunate to be involved with an online case that relies on videos and online material that is part of the UBRIC project hosted at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. And I'm just going to briefly show you this. I hope it. So, um, so this is the home page for the, for the Hubert project, and, you, and it has a lot of these online cases, what are called e-cases. And so um, government nonprofit partnerships, and then you'll, you'll, you'll see another one there's on um, African American Leadership Forum. Um, but then the one that I was involved with is called A New Advocacy Path for Treehouse. And it, it, it really focuses on a organization based in Seattle called Treehouse, which ad does advocacy for foster children. And it talks about their decision, their advocacy strategy, and how they were interacting with the public and, not, and the private sector. Um, and it, it Again, in a dramatic and radical departure from my original exposure to case teaching, which is printed cases, this relies on video clips. So this is, so this is, uh, you can see there's three modules. This is designed to be, you know, with. We've spent over 15 years working in the advocacy field, um, really creating a policy framework through the legislature. And, and then some practice framework as well in collaboration with Children's Administration, which is our state child welfare agency, to try to improve educational outcomes for kids in foster care. Okay, so this is a designed to be taught in a 90-minute session in a class, and there's different modules with three different videos. And, and, um, and so there's a lot of them there. I encourage you to look at the, U the Uber project. But one of the, again, one of the other dramatic changes from when I first got into this in the, in the 80s is that this is open source. This is not copyrighted material. The, the whole idea behind the Uber project is we should develop open source um, uh, cases that would be available to anybody in the world. So um, the, other, the, fi the final point I want to make about the, the transformation of cases is that the early cases in the 1980s often were focused on white male leaders in government and the NGO sectors. <coughs> which was often something that students complained about a great deal back in those days. But the proliferation cases in terms of geographic focus, mode of delivery, and topic is offered the opportunity to offer much greater representation to, to issues of gender, race, ethnicity, national origin, sexuality. Um, so there's much more diversity in cases than we had, you know, um, 30 years ago. So, so um, you know, what I want to talk about now are what I think the implication, these trends that I've highlighted that have kind of transformed case teaching and transformed my teaching, I think have also have implications for how the role of the association and, um, uh, and the, the role of teaching and learning within the association as well. Um, when I joined APSA in 1982 as a young graduate student, um, the only way that I could get the APSA journals was by joining the association and going to the library where I had to often go through the laborious process of copying articles of interest. In those days, the value proposition of membership was tied to journal access and attendance at the conference. The conference was key to upward mobility in the profession and, the pre, and the, particularly in the pre-web era, and it was also a central place for access to new material. Many of the older members in this room will remember the huge room at the annual meeting where the APSA sold conference papers. Um, um, and, um, and you had to lug, you know, 50 copies of the paper to the, to the APSA. And, of course, what they didn't tell you is they were often make, they were making a, lot, a, a nice income off your papers. Um, um, but, uh, um, and so uh, attendees were, again, they were, attendees brought the papers and that's how you, that's, that was a central place for, for getting access to knowledge in the profession. 
The conference was, of course, also much smaller. You know, in the old days, my first, you know, uh, everybody could fit into the Washington Hilton or the Palmer House. It seems hard to believe these days, but that, you know, that was in the early 1980s. Um, and needless to say, so the conference has changed. Needless to say, the journal access in the conference has changed dramatically. Just as no longer you need, to, I need to no longer go to the Kennedy School to get good cases. APSA members can directly access APSA journals online through their libraries. <coughs> Um, and I should mention as an aside even that Cambridge University Press during the last year has, has even digitized every publication ever published by the APSA, including the original proceedings from the early 1900s before the APSR, and, um, and even a short-lived but very interesting political science teacher um, uh, that was kind of like a quasi-newsletter from the 1980s. When I w again, when I was a graduate student, I got this. Uh, John probably remembers the political science teacher, and now, for those libraries that buy it, you can buy access to political science teacher from the 1980s. Um, um, so that the digital revolution has meant that members have easy access to draft papers from a wide variety of courses. The conference paper room, of course, is long gone, and the centrality of the conference as a site of exchange of information and research has been, in, in terms of its prominence, has been greatly diminished. Um, uh, you know, the conference is also involved with, in, because of the growth of the profession. It's much more difficult to get on the conference program. For example, we had over 15,000 separate submissions for the 2014 conference from 8,200 different people. Um, and with the rise of quality in indices like impact factors, upward mobility in the profession is also less tied to the conference and conference presentations and what your discussant says, uh, except for young scholars and scholars with ongoing research projects, especially projects that requiring collaboration among different scholars from different institutions. The diffusion of information is also, well, I, I've already said that point. Okay, so um, another point is that when I, when I joined the APSA, it was essentially the only major political science association. But today, a political scientist is a choice of multiple associations, both in the US abroad. I was just in London and met with APSA board member Ken Benoit, who teaches at the London School of Economics. And he's been quite involved in establishing a relatively new European Political Science Association. Many of you are no doubt members of regional associations that have also grown over the, over the years, as well as other associations like ISA and any number of Latin American Studies Association, any number of other associations. Um, so in short, APSA is just like case programs has changed. APSA is faced with a markedly different value proposition for members. This is, of course, a big topic. And I plan to write on this topic on a number of perspectives over the coming months. But I want to focus here on the implications for the TLC conference and the place of teaching and learning in the field of interest within the association. First, we need to think about the conference as more than a one-time event. For a very long time, members like me attended the conference for two to three days and then did not really think about the conference very much, except for an abstract submission in possibly December until the next annual meeting. Um, we need to approach the conference, whether it's the TLC or the annual meeting, um, um, as, a, as an event rich in content that can be used for the benefit of members throughout the year. For instance, I've been working with APSA Director of Meetings, Lauren West, and the program chairs for the annual meeting, Simon Jackman and Melanie Mannion, to videotape, videotape key sessions and speeches, and then put them on the APSA website and try to engage the membership in an ongoing conversation about the material. Similarly, Richard Houston, um, who's back there uh, videotaping my address here, um, is also going to be wandering around the sessions with the goal of posting uh, material from, from this conference on our website. It's my hope that we can engage everybody and the broader membership in discussions about the material that's been presented here um, through various outlets, including APSA Connect. Um, in addition, we need to diffuse the information and research on teaching and learning through a variety of outlets, including the annual meeting, the website, social media, and communication strategy of the association and its members. Thus, I envision an annual meeting that would have more sessions, including pre-conference workshops on teaching and learning, and the association could do more to recognize outstanding teachers at the annual meeting. APSA is also in the process of overhauling its website, including its data management system and content management system. In my view, an increasingly important role for the association's website is, is, um, is connecting um, important research and information that's of interest to the, members, to the members. And many presentations at this conference 
present some type of innovation approach to teaching, including the pre-conference workshop that I uh, um, was at this morning on MOOCs, um, under the direction of senior direct, APSA Senior Director Liani Pinero Kluge, we are also improving the capability of APSA APSA Connect to create a genuine ongoing community of people with similar interests, including topics such as MOOCs or new approaches to online teaching. The changing value proposition of membership also requires APSA to think more broadly about professional development. We, of course, have various types of professional development activities for a long time, including the conference um, at, the, at the annual conference as well as this conference, but we also have a, a long-standing departmental services program. Um, however, we at APSA, um, including Senior Director for Academic Programs, Jennifer Diascro, are reviewing new professional development strategies, including perhaps a new mentoring program and a small grant program for research on the profession, including issues related to teaching and learning. Jen Diascro and I are also reviewing our advocacy strategy at the association. We are all very pleased that the Coburn Amendment is gone. Um, um, and we, all <laughs> we also realize that new challenges are likely to emerge to NSF and federal funding of political science research. However, one unfortunate consequence of the Coburn Amendment was that our advocacy of the association was focused by necessity on the fight to overturn it. And, um, but we also recognize that, uh, that advocacy, our advocacy at the association cannot be defined by NSF or focused on NSF funding. Instead, a host of very important issues of concern to political scientists in this room and throughout the association are not directly tied to federal research funding. Public policies on student loan programs, academic freedom, accreditation issues, performance assessment, intellectual property are just a few of the many issues that are affecting our members and that we at the association see as important to our advocacy strategy as we go forward. So we recognize that a value proposition for members like you requires the active engagement of the association, its members, and leaders on a broad array of policy issues. Finally, I think it's important for APSA to think creatively about how it, it can help create and support different types of um, communities within the association. I've already mentioned APSA Connect, but I regard the sections as critical to the future of the association. So I believe we need to support the sections as sites of exchange of information and the building of a community of people interested in similar issues, including topics such as teaching and learning. When I entered the profession in 1982, the primary vehicle for creating this community was the annual meeting and to a lesser extent the journals. But the explosion of social media, the rapid pace of innovation, and the explosion of information makes it incumbent as an association on us as an association to use new technologies to support the creation of multi -com multiple communities and members. Thank you. I greatly appreciate this opportunity to speak to you today and look forward to working with you in the future and would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. I mean, why don't we could uh, do a little tag team here. People might have comments, questions for John as well as me. So. I have a question. I'm not actually at a community college, but I've been coming to this conference every year and have been fortunate enough to have uh, faculty from community colleges in a number of the tracks in which I've participated. And uh, you mentioned, John, in your opening remarks that we all uh, universally, it's taken as an axiom that we are knowledge generators as well as disseminators. But for many of our community college uh, colleagues, their contract and their teaching load does not necessarily allow the time for uh, knowledge creation, that their central focus as political science faculty member is knowledge dissemination. So I wonder uh, if you could perhaps clarify those remarks or what role you see for community college faculty in the APSA? Sure. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. Um, excellent question. Let me just start off by saying knowledge generation and knowledge dissemination. We think of it as sort of something aimed for the APSR or that is to say sort of hardcore research. And, you know, sitting in a classroom with students, um, you know, while those are very important parts of that, it's much broader. I mean, thinking about the stuff we were talking about today, how do you make a MOOC? Well, that's generating knowledge, generating knowledge of how do you do this, right? So it's, it's so we need to think, we need to think, and, and I was trying to think broadly about not only, I mean, I was focusing on dissemination and I'm think, thinking that this should be, you know, not, you know, talking about engaging publics generally, but also knowledge creation is not, is not just how do I run this regression uh, on voting behavior, um, but, um, th but thinking cre creatively and, and that's in a variety of contexts and in a, in a variety of ways. So that, that would be my, my position and certainly people vary in the relative balance of effort they put into um, uh, and demands that are placed on them for uh, creation versus dissemination. But, um, but you know, I, I, my, my bet is that people in the community colleges, uh, my one minute um, was learning uh, uh, about Valencia Community College. Um, I, I detect frustration on many community college boards that they would like to have more time to be able to do even more of it but it's not that they're not thinking creatively, it's just that they had to do so in a, in a, in a limited frame of time frame. Does that, does that sufficiently answer your question? Yes, the, the broader definition of knowledge generation that you know in um, mm -hmm. simply the traditional research right. that ends up in research journals. Yes, thank you. Question? Other questions? Yeah, John Berg, I'm kind of intrigued by what you say about, uh, you know, the annual meeting losing much of its function. Is that, does that imply rethinking the role of the annual meeting? Um, I, I, think that the, um, I think that the centrality of the annual meeting um, as a place where you, um, where, where you access research and connected with college, uh, connected with colleagues, has certainly changed. I, because you can network with colleagues through the internet and through, you know, um, and, and information is much more diffused now, I mean, and much more easily accessible. So I do think that we are, um, um, re, re th I think that to the extent that, um, that the role of the annual meeting has changed, I think that, that one, that does require thinking about the different differences in format differences in how the kind of information that you might be presenting. Um, I think that, um, uh, and, and we've, I've had some conversations with the program chairs, Simon Jackman and Melanie Mannion about that. And we're, we're doing some innovations this year. We're gonna do, try to do remote streaming. Um, we're, um, we, we have, in, think we've enlisted Kofi Annan to come and speak. Um, I think, I think, I. <laughs> I think, um, and, um, and so I think that the, the annual meeting, I think, has to be something that, that is not, it, I think to be, in, in the current era, you have to provide more of a value added for people to go to the annual meeting. And, and that, I think, means kind of rethinking the format, maybe having more mixed panels. Um, I mean, there are a wide variety of things that you could do with the annual meeting. You could have a 30-minute, you know, we've even talked about having like a 30-minute presentation by somebody and then having a discussing. You know, um, you know, I mean, there's a wide variety of innovations that one could do in the format, and I think that the changing role, the, the, the changes that have occurred in the environment for the annual meeting, I think, require us to think about the format. And, and I do think that maybe thinking more about, you know, um, maybe there's an increased role for different new and different types of pre-conference workshops that we haven't that we need to think about um, in DC this year we've thought about well maybe we should have some panels on Capitol Hill 
um, that fits in with our public engagement role. Um, you know, so I mean, there. I think that that we're thinking about innovations, and I think that that um, I think that you have to be thinking about that in the current environment. So, so just, you want to? I just want to to follow up on that a little bit, and that is that um, you know we're in a position, not kind of kind of like not too far away from where where I was when I went to college. It was the I, I'm at the very beginning of the post-war baby boom. And so it's been a huge change for higher education, a great deal of adaptation. We're at, at now, you know, for the information society driven, ma massive change that's going to affect, be affecting higher education. That's going to affect the APSA, it is, is, and will continue to be. But what's, of course, critical is, you know, guys like this, um, who, uh, it's, it's really going to be, it's really going to be the, the, the new generation of, uh, of political scientists mm -hmm. who are going to be able to take us into the, into the new era and help us define what, what a, a conference is going to be like, what the journals are going to be like, uh, what this teaching and learning conference is going to be like, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, the uh, question regarding uh, how community colleges, uh, junior colleges, uh, brought to mind uh, state political associations. And uh, I've been involved in the Illinois Political Science Association. And what I've noticed in the last few years is de a definite uptick in interest on the part of faculty teaching in community colleges. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's a, a great opportunity there for interaction between people from four-year institutions, the graduate institutions, mm -hmm. and community mm -hmm. colleges. And also in conjunction with what we do here, uh, state associations and their conferences provide an excellent outlet for both mm -hmm. undergraduate and graduate students uh, testing their research Absolutely. and faculty sending their students to those conferences. So my question is, is that what kind of opportunities might be available to strengthen relations between the APSA and state associations beyond just having sort of a list, uh, a, a link you have to kind of search to actually find those associations and just what opportunities you see for, for that type of kind of year-round type interaction and providing them with resources? Um, that's, a, that's a great question and it's something that I, I see as a, as a kind of critical role for, um, for APSA. I, I just was at the Southern and uh, in New Orleans, and some of you may know that they have a new executive director from Georgia State named Robert, who's a professor at Robert, How uh, Robert Howard uh, at Georgia State. And, and he and I have already had some uh, exchanges of emails, and, and we had a long conversation at New Orleans about how APSA could, could help support the Southern as it moves forward. He's been in touch with Lauren West, our meetings chair here. Um, and, and so I see an important role for APSA as strengthening the state and regional associations and you know as you know many of the state and regional associations either have no staff or or a very small staff and so I think that 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 we have a lot of experience that could be beneficial to the regional and state associations that I think is an important role for APSA um, I mentioned to you I was in London talking to Ken Benoit and he he, he has been exchanging emails with me and, and Lauren West about ways that we could help him with, with supporting some of his administrative and infrastructure issues. So, so I, I absolutely agree, and I think to the extent that, that APSA, and, and as it overhauls its website, could provide more of a portal to f and connect people to state regional associations, I certainly think that that would be an important way, function as well. So, great question, thank you. So I was very excited to hear about the idea of putting more uh, energy into APSA teaching and learning and building up uh, the uh, teaching and dissemination approach. Uh, I think it would be great if we could also bring more of that to the, the annual APSA meeting, mm -hmm. an effort to increase more tracks, uh, mm -hmm. bring tracks that are going to be of interest to community colleges and other mm -hmm. kinds of institutions whose primary focus is on teaching. I think that would really strengthen mm -hmm. and create uh, pollination across the two areas. Um, I also, you were talking about innovations at, at the APS annual meeting. One of the things that I think makes uh, TLC really amazing as a, as a uh, conference is the track approach. 
And I know that we can't do the track approach across all of APSA, the APSA annual meeting, but if we could have some tracks where it really is built as a track approach, where there's a room set aside and you have a track and you do what we do here, uh, I think that would have the potential to be really, really attractive and get some, some real interesting synergies going. Go ahead. And, uh, I have some thoughts. Okay. Um, and speaking of the Southerns, um, about, it was about three or four years ago, uh, I, uh, I was asked actually to figure out how to, how to do something like this. And we, I, I called it a conference within a convention. And, and, you know, with advanced planning, we were able to, as you say, set aside a room. I actually had two rooms. And they were they provided us with some you know beverages and this sort of thing to keep it together. And we had a we had a whole day, uh, ending with we had and a lunch and then a and then a, a, a dinner, um, and a keynote address and so forth. Um, and that was very popularly received, and it brought different people into the conference than who uh, otherwise would have come. They they then expanded to five or six at a time, so there was a precedent for doing something very similar to tracking in a, you know, a relatively big, not quite APSA level, but size, but you know, pretty big size. That, the, the additional thing that, re, that makes, helps make it possible besides advanced planning is, is negotiating with the pro hotels so you have hotels that have the right kind of facilities to set this thing up. Anyway, so, yes, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I just would um, completely agree and, and Simon and Melanie and I have been have been talking about that in in on some limited circumstances for this year with some particular subfields. Um, it gets a little complicated with the annual meeting because um, the without getting into too much of a discussion, um, we the way the annual meeting is structured is if you compare the APSA to say sociology, sociology itself. Ha I mean the 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 program committee and has, more, has greater control over the entire program, and, and the sections have a l smaller piece of the, the, the total program. So the ability to design conferences within a conference, the program committee in some sense has a greater discretion, where the way that APSA has structured the conference is that a vast majority, about 80 or 85 percent of the, the meeting, is al the panels are allocated to the sections. And so the, the ability to create conferences with those kinds of tracks is, becomes complicated from a logistical standpoint. But I think it's, it's absolutely worth pursuing. I've, I've done some work in Europe in the last five or six years, and some of you know that many of the European conferences are entirely organized that way. And you know even some large conferences you know, where you have 1,000 or 2,000 people are entirely organized on tracks. So, so I think that a lot of more, to the extent that more of our members have been exposed to that, that way of holding conferences, I think that we, at, we of course, have to, I think, adapt that as, as, as much as we can, so. Thank you very much, and please join me again in thanking Stephen Ratcliffe Smith <laughs> for his insightful comments today, and John Aldridge. And thank you again for the insightful questions that you had. Um, I would just, before I let you go off to your track sessions, which begin at 2.15 p.m., I would just draw your attention to the inside cover of your program, which includes a schedule at a glance. And that's kind of your roadmap as you go throughout the weekend um, so that you kind of know when you're supposed to be in your track session, when you have a, an open space to go to a workshop, and the, all of the workshops are listed in the back of the program. And also, I would note at 4 p.m., it's an, an all-workshop session. So there won't be any meeting of the tracks. Instead, you're encouraged to find one of the wonderful workshops, to attend that, to you know, do some interactive work there as well. And then I would invite you again to return in the evening to this room for the opening reception at 6.30 p.m., where we will have a special memorial tribute to Craig Bryans, one of our dear colleagues who passed away earlier this year. And we will also be highlighting some of the other teaching and learning initiatives uh, that are featured within the association. So once again, thank you so much. And 
enjoy the day. Have a great meeting. Thank you.